For as utterly divided as the Star Wars fanbase is, it seems like the one thing most people can agree on is that Attack of the Clones is arguably the weakest of the prequels. I wouldn't say that it's not good. In fact, there's a lot about Episode 2 that I absolutely love, but the midpoint of the prequel trilogy is hindered by one major flaw. It's not actually a Star Wars film. Let me explain. Whereas most installments in the franchise focus on one or two planes of action throughout the runtime, Attack of the Clones attempts to track three to five storylines simultaneously, and each one winds up feeling like its own distinct film. That's why today we'll be analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of each of these mini movies and rating them on a scale from one to 10. I'm Dylan, and this is The Writer's Block. Right off the bat, the film opens with an assassination attempt on Padme. She's a senator now, and the leader of the We Don't Want War committee, so the Separatists aren't exactly her biggest fans. There's already been a lot said about how convoluted the assassination plot is, so I won't focus on that too much, but after Darth Sidious tries to do a murder with like 15 extra steps, Obi-Wan is given the task of tracking down the man responsible. This kicks off the noir-inspired detective storyline, which is the first mini-movie that I want to examine. Personally, I think this is the weakest link in Attack of the Clones. To be fair, Obi-Wan as Jedi Sherlock Holmes is awesome, and his quest to unravel the mystery starts off pretty strong. The whole concept of a missing planet and the intrigue of the Jedi's knowledge being tampered with is utterly compelling, but the narrative quickly loses steam once Obi-Wan gets to Kamino. We find out that Jedi Master Cameron Diaz ordered a clone army be raised on behalf of the Republic Public roughly 10 years ago. While the lore and world building done here is incredibly rich and fascinating, it's also not very well explained. Understanding the specific details of these events requires the viewer to do research outside of the movie itself, which makes the payoff feel anticlimactic. I'm a huge fan of Star Wars Explained content, but you shouldn't need it to make sense of the main mystery in the film. Additionally, the pursuit of Jango Fett feels largely unresolved. Once Obi-Wan realizes that he's one of like 30 people involved in the assassination attempt, he pursues Jango and his son all the way to Geonosis. But once they're there, the two never interact. Mace Windu is the one who kills Fett in the arena, which feels kind of like when Arya Stark kills the Night King. The two characters have no history, so the conclusion feels unearned. It would have been much more satisfying for Obi-Wan and Jango to have a rematch. The storyline definitely has its moments, especially because Obi-Wan's sass meter is off the charts throughout all of it. But even so, Sherlock Holmes, Shadow of the Dark Side gets a 4 out of 10. Obi-Wan's mystery storyline is also heavily interwoven with the political elements at the heart of Episode 2. It's revealed in the opening crawl that a contingent of Separatist systems have broken off from the Republic and formed their own alliance, and more information and political unrest is thrown at the viewer constantly throughout the film. However, unlike Phantom Menace, which focused heavily on the boring bureaucratic elements of the Senate, Attack of the Clones zeroes in on the much more interesting conspiracy side of things. This film gives us arguably the best depiction of Palpatine in the entire saga. His devious plans and dark influence looms throughout the entire movie. It's astounding just how heavily he's playing different parties and factions against one another. When Padme's assassination fails, he suggests that the senator be guarded by her old friends, Obi-Wan and Anakin. He knows that Anakin has feelings for her, and the more those feelings are ignited, the easier easier it will be to further the divide between Anakin and the Jedi Council. When Padme goes into hiding, she appoints Jar Jar Binks as her representative. As mentioned previously, she's in stark opposition to creating an army. But as soon as she's gone, Palpatine pressures Jar Jar into calling for emergency powers to be granted to the Supreme Chancellor. Side note, the fact that Jar Jar is responsible for the death of democracy in the Star Wars universe is bonkers and hilarious. During all this, the Jedi are 
having their own troubles. Their ranks are wearing thin, and their vision has become shrouded by the dark side. Of all the prequels, this is the only one that explicitly deals with the concept of the Jedi becoming complacent and overconfident. Jedi Masters Yoda and Mace Windu spend a great deal of time trying to figure out what darkness looms on the horizon. We see them conversing with the Jedi Council and monitoring the Senate, but overall, they're pretty helpless, which I think is a really interesting position to put them in. Additionally, the shift from peacekeepers to soldiers is a highly compelling part of this narrative. It's not fleshed out as much as it should be, but the Battle of Geonosis has ramifications for the Jedi that cannot be understated. Their role in the galaxy is radically changed now that war has broken out. And while Geonosis might seem like a victory, Yoda wisely points out that the Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen. The politics of Episode 2 are incredibly fascinating, and the only reason I'm taking away any points is because at times they can be too densely packed. That's why placeholder name that I'll fix later is an 8 out of 10. Next, let's look at the storyline with the most missed potential. I'm, of course, talking about the buddy cop dynamic between Obi-Wan and Anakin. The prequels as a whole have a bad habit of letting the most interesting moments take place off screen, and this this movie is the worst offender. When the Jedi duo first arrives on Coruscant, we get a bit of playful banter about their previous adventures together. And while this does a great job setting up their brotherly dynamic, it also leaves me scratching my head wondering why we didn't get to see any of these cool missions. The time jump between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones means that the audience doesn't get to see the pivotal bonding moments between Master and Apprentice. Kenobi talks to Anakin maybe three times in all of the first film, so it was a wild choice to just skip over so much of their relationship. That being said, Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen nail the intricacies of their dynamic. Obi-Wan is a by-the-book, sometimes harsh teacher, but only because he has so much faith in Anakin and wants to see him live up to his true potential. Anakin's ambition and hastiness makes him desperate for his master's approval, and he often mistakes Kenobi's criticism for rejection. The big issue with this storyline, however, is that the two are split up for a large portion of the film. It's similar to The Last Jedi in that when you divide your protagonists up into different groups, the audience feels like they're missing out on the character dynamics they're most excited for. I get that Padme and Anakin needed some alone time, but I think if Obi-Wan was in close proximity during those sequences, it would add a deeper layer of scandal and secrecy. Anytime McGregor and Christensen share a a scene or two, the buddy cop dynamic is a 10 out of 10. But unfortunately, the amount of missed opportunities in this film means that Coruscant Vice gets a 6 out of 10. Now, it's time to talk about my favorite aspect of Attack of the Clones. This is where the fun begins. Episode 2 is basically four different films in a trench coat. But more than anything, I think this movie longs to be a somewhat steamy romance novel. Not quite on the level of Fifty Shades of Grey, but more so a along the lines of Bridgerton or Titanic. The love story between Anakin and Padme is modeled after the sweeping romantic epics of a bygone era, and the Star Wars universe is the perfect place to tell a story of this type. The Jedi are forbidden from forming attachments, so there's a tantalizing element of secrecy inherent in their star-crossed romance. Both of them must wrestle with fulfilling their duties or following their hearts. For Anakin in particular, this leads to a lot of the internal conflict that will come to a head in Revenge of the Sith. Because of the Jedi's strict policies, Anakin isn't allowed to return home to his mother. Therefore, when Shmi is killed by Tusken Raiders, Anakin in large part blames the Council. This drives him to form an even more intense and possessive bond with Padme, and resolves to never let something like this happen again. Anyone or anything that comes between Anakin and the one he loves will experience his unbridled wrath. As for the chemistry between Christensen and Natalie Portman, I think it's highly underrated. George Lucas's dialogue and direction kind of makes them come across like they're two aliens pretending to be humans, but those aliens are clearly head over heels for each other. Their relationship evolves in some really cool ways throughout the runtime. In early scenes, Anakin clearly puts the senator on a pedestal. Padme is basically the popular girl from high school that he's had a crush on for years. He's built their 
union up in his head so much that he can't help but be painfully awkward. I don't like Sam. Padme, on the other hand, still sees him as that little boy I knew on Tatooine, and is initially dismissive of his advances. However, as she begins to see all the ways Anakin has matured, she begins to warm up to him. When Anakin and Padme finally kiss, even though they resolve not to do so again, it's clear they've fallen for each other. Their somewhat opposite approaches to life and politics actually complement each other quite well, and the two continue to bond despite the restrictions on their relationship. Whether they're romantically involved or not, Anakin and Padme make a great team, which we see exemplified on their journey to Tatooine and eventual rescue attempt on Geonosis. Of course, all the pretense fades away when it looks like their lives are coming to an end. I love this beat because Padme is the one who decides to take their relationship to a new level. She's given a ton of agency in this movie, allowing her to be both a compelling love interest and a lead character at the same time. By concluding the love story with their wedding, which is visually contrasted against the clone army on Coruscant, the movie cements how powerful their love is, but also communicates the ample tragedy that awaits them. The fact that their love theme is called Across the Stars heavily foreshadows that things aren't going to end well. Padme and Anakin's relationship is the most consistent storyline throughout the whole film, which helps it stand out as arguably the strongest part of episode 2. That's why Bridgerton, the senator and I, is a 9 out of 10. Ultimately, Attack of the Clones is a textbook case of too much of a good thing. Any one of these mini-movies could have made for a top-tier Star Wars film, but trying to pack them all into two hours results in a highly inconsistent product. After all, there's a reason The Clone Wars needed to be seven seasons long. I'm Dylan, and this has been The Writer's Block.